What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of The Theological Arsonist. Uh, I'm the host, Jonah Saller. If this is your first time listening, I just want to let you know we love you. We're glad you're here. Jesus loves you. He's glad you're here. And we pray that this is edifying and encouraging to you today. If you're a longtime supporter um, and you want to support me even more, I have a link up. It'll be right in the cover photo on the YouTube page, or if you're listening to this, you can find me um, just by going to my description box. I have this there, but I have a, a, a place where you can support me called Patreon. And there are different tiers, a dollar tier, a $5 tier, and a $10 tier. And with those different tiers, there are different benefits that come with that for your support. So if my ministry has impacted you, I would really appreciate that. But without further ado, I want to introduce my guest. This is Sean, better known as Shawnee the Kid uh, over on TikTok. Um, I'm really grateful to have him here with me today. And so, Sean, please just introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about who you are. Hey, guys, what's up? Uh, my real name is Sean Knuff. Uh, I live in Pennsylvania near Lancaster, Lebanon County, and um, I just turned 40. <laughs> um, but I, uh, I actually I got on TikTok to keep an eye on my daughter. I have a teenage daughter, and, like, I don't know, I get kind of – what is she up to? You know, I would be too nosy, but so I started an account just to kind of like see what's happening. And I end up seeing a couple of preachers, Jonah's one of them, just sharing the gospel. And I'm like, wow, what a cool way to do that. So I just kind of, just kind of happened. I don't know. But uh, anyway, I, uh, I wanted to come on here and just kind of say hi, tell a little bit about my story. I made a lot of friends on TikTok. I've been getting like a lot of really positive comments about how much my little ministry there or whatever is helping them. And so, you know, it's just something I do for fun when I'm driving or when I'm coming home from work. So I, I really enjoy it. <laughs> I don't know what people think of me and I honestly don't really know what I'm doing. I'm just praying that God's using me uh, to do it, whatever it is. So <laughs> well, one, th one thing I can say right off the bat, brother, is that when I, when I watch your videos, if I could use one word to describe you, it's approachable. I think okay. that that's one thing that a lot of other Christians sometimes don't, don't have, like some, especially the disconnect. If you're not a believer, approaching a Christian when there sometimes is this certain attitude they carry with them can be tough. You're super, super approachable. That was one of the first things I noticed. I'm like, this guy is like so easy going. This is awesome. So, <laughs> that's cool. So, yeah. yeah. Get, Getting, getting into this topic, I, I want to just, wherever you want to start, I would love to hear your testimony. I'd love for you to share um, where, where you began this journey, how you became a Christian. So wherever you want to start, brother. Yeah, dude. I mean, I can't really put my finger on what made me a Christian other than, you know, from reading the Bible, it says that uh, God, he, uh, he changes our heart. And I feel like I grew up uh, with no chance at all. Uh, I grew up in a very poor family, a lot of crazy, you know, family issues. My parents were divorced. Uh, when I was a year old, they got a divorce. I have a younger brother that grew up in it too. Who's, um, a couple years younger than me. And, uh, you know, my parents, uh, if you're listening now, I love you guys. So don't think I'm ripping on you, but it, it, it was a lot of just, um, trying to figure out how to survive as a kid because I went, I would live with my dad for a little bit and then he would, my dad's been in and out of jail a few times. I would get like passed over to my mom. She would disappear. I was in foster care uh, real young with my younger brother when he was a baby. I remember that. I remember um, just being at my aunt's house, being at my other aunt's house, switching schools. And there was really no, stability whatsoever mm. and I loved my parents and I loved them as a kid you know but it was like we never knew where we were going to be at right. and growing up like that with no foundation whatsoever um it was really kind of hard but I didn't know any better so I'm not like I know some kids like they grow up in a rough environment and they like hate their parents or something yeah. and I have every right in the world I think probably to hate my parents uh, in the world, but I understand that people get fed circumstances that they can't fix. 
Yeah. And my mom, you know, comes from a family that she has five other siblings. She was raised by my grandma only. Mm. And my grandfather was very abusive to her. He, my grandmother was a very pretty lady uh, when she was younger and she was going to be like a movie star and a singer. And my grandfather, who I never met, by the way, uh, he broke her jaw so bad from punching her that she lived with serious jaw pain like her entire life. And she had to raise six kids like that. Wow. And so uh, in that, you know, my grandmother is a tough cookie. Uh, mm -hmm. She's, you know, I believe she's in heaven right now. She died a couple of years ago, but she um, growing up, I saw how like my grandma, would, she would wake up and pray all the time. Like she'd light a candle and she would just pray. And I didn't know what she was saying. I remember like as a kid, if I would go to her house, she would like, you know, put me and my brother to bed and she would say our prayers with us and stuff. It was something that was kind of like special to me. But other than that, there was no, um, you know, Christianity or, yeah. you know, talking about Jesus too much. Um, my dad and my mom both went to uh, Catholic school growing up, but they were like, they hated school. They never talked about any of that stuff to me, really. My dad did a little bit when I was younger, but, you know, it was in one ear and out the other. And my dad's a believer. I know that for sure. Um, but growing up, I, I, there was no, like, I don't know. Like, my dad would have a big party and get, like, hammered. And the one time he, like, grabbed the Christmas tree and started dancing with it, you know, like, my dad's, like, a crazy guy. But <laughs> like my dad's actually a really awesome guitar player by the way we'll hang out very cool but i'm just saying like it would go from that to like my dad i go to school he try to like tell me about jesus and i'm like yeah right dude you know what i mean sure so i don't know man it's like my parents like i said they were divorced and i would be passed back and forth all the time and i kind of grew up being entertained with like tv um go to random babysitters all the time um i remember watching like I, when i was a kid i really watched like a lot of horror movies like i watch a lot of like freddy krueger i thought that was really cool yeah and nightmare on elm street uh and uh what's it called uh, friday the 13th that kind of stuff and like i don't know like i just kind of grew up with sort of a twisted mind i guess i don't know but um and it's not that my parents are bad people or anything like that it was just like you know everybody's just so grows up we, like we didn't have no money like my family has had nothing growing up I, I i remember i used to like stay with my dad in these like low-income housing places all the time and be eating like rice all the time you know yeah and just like but my dad he would always do everything he possibly could to make sure that me and my brother were taken care of mm. and i know that he always tried you know what i mean even though things weren't perfect he always tried and so we me and my younger brother we always kind of latched on to my dad and my mom um she has a lot of anger towards my dad from their marriage you know and stuff and so growing up I grew up around a lot of fighting and arguing and my sure. mom and dad not getting along even though they didn't live together you know we go to my dad's he'd be like your mom's crazy we go to my mom she's like your dad's crazy you don't listen to him and so when you become a teenager in that, you're like, well, I'm not going to listen to either one of you. <laughs> sure. And it's just, so I started doing kind of, when I was probably 13 years old, uh, I got in a fight with my mom and I ran away from home and that like broke her heart because I just, me and her, she tried to punish me and I jumped out of a window and went to my dad's and it was like just craziness over there with this ex-girlfriend stabbing him with forks uh the one time she like had this hot grease she's gonna throw it on him because they're drunk arguing and it was just craziness and like i would never want to come home i would just go out in the streets hang yeah. out with people get to know you know ran i hung out with a lot of older people uh that were in their 20s and i was only like 14 i was like the, the kid yeah. <laughs> of hence the name say <laughs> So, but the thing is, like, I, I just kind of grew up like that, not anyone's fault. I just, you know, I had to do me because I knew my family was just out of control. Right. And 
you know, I, you know, having a childhood like that, it's like, all you do is think and you think too hard. Like you think all about your problems all the time. You're depressed. You know, you can't, for me, I went to Hershey high school, Hershey chocolate. Uh, the high school there is all these rich kids. There's, there's a hospital there and all the kids, most of them's parents are doctors and nurses and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was like the poorest kid at school and I would go to school and just not fit in, didn't have the cool clothes. Uh, you know, I started hanging out with this guy who I call my blood brother. Uh, his name's KC. Me and him were into all this weird satanic stuff when mm. I was a teenager. We just thought we'd just, you know, tick everybody off <laughs> yeah. and just do whatever. We were like the freaks of the school. Um, not to brag, but I, I have the highest in-school suspension uh, of all time in ninth grade. I had I was in ISS for 58 days. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. And I, the thing is, though, is that like I needed to I needed to feel loved. You know what I mean? Like I, I didn't have that. And my buddy who <laughs> we were into the worst stuff, like, you know, not even like anything, just uh, always hanging out, always being together, having fun, you know, meeting people, meeting girls, just running around. That's that was my life as a teenager. And I thought that it was going to make me happy. And I started getting addicted to like alcohol really bad. I got, um, you know, just doing like acid, doing stuff, stupid stuff like that. And, you know, I became like the worst of the worst. And when I was 17, um, I was being passed from different schools uh, high school so many times that they didn't even know what grade I was in when I, I should have been in like 10th or 11th grade they didn't even know what grade I was in because my papers would be like two schools back and oh, it wow. takes like a year or two to switch them and I would always be switching I went to like four or five different high schools man wow the thing is is you know I finally got sick of it like when I was about 17 one of my friends offered me a job in Florida but I would have to quit high school. So I'm like, talk to my dad about it. He's like, do it. You know, you're not there anyway. <laughs> and I'm like, done. So I want, I remember going in and I signed out and the principal's like, see ya. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I don't know. I just, uh, I moved to Florida and I worked for this company building mausoleums. Mm. You know, mausoleum is uh, like, they don't, coffins in the ground down south because they'll okay. float water tables high so they put mm -hmm. them in the buildings got it and i was 17 i lied to the boss to get the job i told him i was 18 wow. and then i got this job down there and uh it was uh <clears throat> it was a pretty wild job man a bunch of crazy guys like <laughs> the boss was like a major crack addict oh, and no. it, it just went sour and wow. i worked in Florida for like three months and I got pretty bad and I'm like I gotta I gotta take a break so I came home I met this girl and I ended up staying at home uh you know never went back to the job it was a big mess but um the girl I met was like a heroin addict and I didn't know it and mm -hmm. I was dating her or whatever and I got into that stuff that was really bad and it was like a never-ending um downward spiral of drugs and depression and stuff and uh i ended up just freaking out man i don't know like i i, I like my i already had sort of mental issues and i just went crazy and i mean i was poisoning my mind with a lot of occult thinking sure um a lot of that new age stuff and uh occult stuff can be really really poisoning and people don't realize um what they're doing to their mind until they want out and then when you want out it's really hard to get away from and it takes years uh if you were into it as bad as me it takes years for your mind to heal from that yeah uh mm -hmm. yeah so anyway i uh i came home and i was all screwed up man ended up in the hospital a couple times ended up uh the girl that was giving me heroin died from oh, a heroin 
um, friends of mine were dying from doing drugs. And, you know, I met my wife. <laughs> I don't know why she liked me, dude. <laughs> but she wasn't into it like that. I mean, you know, if anybody was a bad influence on her, it was me. Yeah. And, you know, she was the first person ever that actually cared about me mm. and really truly was like, she would flip out on me if I like did drugs and she would just, I don't know. She just cared. I don't know. Mm. And nobody else in my life really cared. And that's the provision of God, my friend. <laughs> yeah. So that's what I'm getting to, man. Yeah. Like crazy. Like I, I feel like, you know, when I first saw my wife and you're the only guy I know that we had this conversation when I saw my wife, I'm like, I'll take that. <laughs> and, and me and her, I just started talking to her and I'm like, I wanted to marry her. Like I knew right away. Yeah. And so we got married pretty young and you know, not, my mom was not feeling it. And I ended up, we went to Las Vegas and got married cause it was a big nightmare to try to get married here. Wow. And it kind of broke her mom's heart because her mom's like super nice. But, you know, I didn't want a bunch of fighting at my wedding. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, man. Like, so I know I threw a lot out there, but I, until I met my wife, I never lived anywhere for an entire year until mm. I met her that I can remember at all. I always moved. And when we got our first apartment, that was like home like we got a cat his name was mitch and that was it and we that was my home and i yeah. that so much to me and you know after getting away from i don't know how i stopped doing drugs dude like i i, I can't tell you like i you know i was i was at rite aid like a pharmacy yeah i'm coming out and i see this flyer on the wall for karate and i'm like <laughs> ripped it off the wall and at the time I was a smoker and I wanted to quit smoking. And I'm like, I think this will work. So I just stuck this karate folder, like this thing off the wall. Yeah. Dude, <laughs> I go in there and I had like long hair at the time. And my karate teacher, the guy, I didn't know him, but I go in there and he's like, what do you want? And I'm like, I want to learn karate. <laughs> and he's like, why? And I'm like, I said, I don't know. I said, I, I need something for me to like stay out of trouble. <laughs> and he's like, really? And I'm like, yeah. And then I remember like a couple of days later I called and I was at this party where all these people were like doing drugs and stuff. And I was on the phone with the karate teacher and I'm like, yeah, man, you know, when can I start? And he's like, come in uh, next week and we'll talk about it. And so I go in there and uh, I'm signing up. It was May 24th, 2000. That was, that was the day. So the day. yeah. So I, uh, I'm sitting in this little office and I'm looking out this window and I'm not really a fighter. Like I always got beat up at school. I got jumped in 10th grade by a bunch of dudes, yeah. drug me around by my hair and kicked me in the face, all kinds of stuff like that. Cause I was always the new guy at school and people didn't like me. So sure. I don't know. But anyway, uh, we, uh, started the karate class and, you know, I felt for the first time in my life, I could order, I had some kind of discipline foundation and it wasn't even so much about fighting. It was more just get the class exercise and get away from these bad people and these bad drugs. And I feel like at that point in my life, God really saw that I wanted to change, I guess. And I feel so blessed. I mean, I have so many stories dude, of stuff from karate, man. It's, it's amazing. But um, yeah, like that's, that's, I didn't become a Christian then. That was when I was 20 years old. But from the time I was 20 till I was 26, I trained really hard because I wanted to get a black belt. Sure. I thought that my black belt was going to mean something and like everybody was going to care and I was going to like do something with it. I didn't know what. And I went through all that stuff, got the black belt. I felt like nobody cared. My <laughs> wife cared a little bit. My dad came to my black belt test, you know, but other than that, like no one cared. And I felt really depressed. I broke my knee. I, I snapped my uh, ACL like off and I had to have a major knee surgery. And as I got a broken knee, I took my black belt test with my leg flying all around. And the grandmaster's like, 
you don't have to spar. <laughs> but he, he knew I could spar, but he's like, you could, you're good. Because <laughs> my knee was flying back. Anyway. Oh, man. But yeah, dude, so, you know, getting to where we did that, I got the surgery, and it was like six months of like nothing. I got really depressed, and I'm like, this is not working for me, man. And I'm like, I, I, at that time, I sort of dropped all the occult stuff, and I became sort of like an atheist, I guess. Okay. And I was never like an outspoken atheist. I didn't even know there was such a word, but right. I just, like, you know, didn't give any, you know, thing to anything. And um, my, I started a roofing business when I was 21 okay. and it became very successful. I kind of did it on my own, um, learned roofing from my dad as a kid on a, that kind of snowballed. It's, it's doing really well. But the thing is, um, when my daughter, I mean, when my wife came to work the one day, she's like, we're having a baby. And I'm like, what? And I was like, whoa, mind trip. Like, yeah, I got it as a man, I got to get it together. What is up? And just after that moment, like anything for some reason that had to do with God or anything, I was just totally drawn to it for some reason. Mm. And I was actually at, um, my class and one of my students was like hey you should come to church with us sean and i'm like yeah sure i'll go and i i went by myself and i went into the church and i was like terrified to walk in the church i thought like i was going to catch on fire dude <laughs> wow. and i was i just felt really weird and out of place and stuff and i remember the pastor told this really sad story about this kid getting killed and the dad was like upset and i was bawling and I had to leave like I just ran out <laughs> and wow. I ran home and I'm like I'm never going there again oh. but God was really doing stuff because at that time I got invited uh, my wife got invited one of her friends to their church and we were kind of went to all these little you know church spots and I started talking to people and I just felt this real draw and so me and my wife ended up going uh, to a church that was nearby just randomly you know and the one day I'm just like, I want to do this. <laughs> like I don't know if God's real cause we're having a, a girl and if heaven's real, like I want her to go there. I don't care. I don't, I don't care what it takes. Like I want to know. And so I was just full blown like in <laughs> and I, God was really talking to me, dude. And I didn't know what I was doing. I still kind of don't, I didn't know the Bible at that time, but I knew that there was something happening that, I couldn't quite put my finger on all the little circumstances and all the little thing, all the little signs and all the little stuff. You know how that is. Right. Right. I couldn't quite figure it out. And I'm like, is this God? Like this has to be God because like, you know, my life was changing and, right. and God was calling me. And so, yeah, so that's, that's, that's how that started, bro. <laughs> that's amazing, man. I, I'm I'm always so amazed when I hear people give their testimony, especially when they come from a more extreme type past like you did, because I, I think I think what you can see in your story is that over and over and over again, there was this longing for love and, and yeah. belonging, you know, and 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 I think as you as you mentioned, you know, when you met your wife, you know, that was the first time you'd really felt genuinely loved and accepted by somebody for who you were, you know? And to me, I just, there, there's a spiritual element to that, you know, because that that's God right there awakening something in you that sparked an awakening that further it, it's, it's him. It's his revelation to you through your wife that kept, <laughs> you know, growing from there. And so I'm just, I'm so encouraged hearing this because when sometimes people i think they they ask the question you know why why do things like this happen to people why are they born into certain circumstances and go through certain life like why if god is good why do these things happen and to me when i when i hear a story like you just told i see something beautiful <laughs> as weird as that may sound because to me I, the the thing that goes through my mind is it, how could have God done it any other way? If that makes sense, you know, like, 
Like you are who you are today, walking with God the way you are today because of the, that very story that you just told. If those things didn't happen, how would you be in the place that you are right now? Like to me, that's just a testimony to his sovereignty and the fact that even when we can't explain certain things while we're going through them, looking back, we can go, okay, I, I see what you've been doing this whole time, God, you know? So yeah. I think that that's beautiful. Um, I want to give you, go about ahead. That. Like you said that like, it just keeps going and going, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like so true because like, because of me, like being poor as a kid, yeah. um, I'm not really a rich guy, but God has given me a giving heart. When I was a kid, like I'd give people my stuff. I don't care. I'm already poor. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? And so what's right. really cool is now I have like a business. I make, pretty good money like i'm financially stable and you know a lot of people knock the pros prosperity gospel and i know that that's wrong but for some people like for me i never even had a place to live man and god has a house here i am grateful for my house i am grateful that i have a vehicle i am grateful that i have money coming in that i can take care of my family my kids will never have to grow up the way i did my kids will never have to struggle about, you know, dad might not come. I'm, they might have to go here, there, everywhere. My kids will never have to deal with that. And that means so much to me that I don't care. Like I, I was thinking this earlier, like in Proverbs, knowledge is more valuable than jewels and gold. Right. So I feel like God's got me at a place where I can just give freely. Like it doesn't matter. Like yeah. my, what he's done with me is amazing because I, and it's not about me. It's about God, but I'm just saying like the way he did it, just like you said, the way that it all played out and every little situation and his word, like make, putting, making that, making God's word, uh, which is something we could talk about how this affects my life. Like yeah. making God's word relevant to your life is like the best thing ever. And I feel like my life, was crap until I was like 30 years old. And in the past, like 10, 15 years, it, it's making sense. And not only is it making sense, God, it's like, God, let me struggle a little bit because now all the fruits happening. And right. it's like, I'm happy. I've never been this happy in my life, dude. No, that's <laughs> and, awesome, bro. Great. And like, I, I, I never felt like I would be really anybody. And I have friends that really look up to me, yeah. dude. I, I was hospitalized against my will, locked in beds, like being injected with medicines, like telling me I'm never getting out of the hospital, you know, attacking doctors, like crazy stuff like that, that people still go through today that are going to be depressed forever. But it's like through my circumstances and through the word, I feel like God has like geniusly done whatever it is he's done with me and i feel like i can be a true witness yeah. i'm i work at a ministry you know i told you about the ministry and stuff um but besides that like i i don't need to work at a ministry i can work with people individually i can just hang out with people like i'm a karate teacher still i, I teach boxing too and kickboxing but it's it's just amazing how it all ties together and i feel really sad for people that don't understand God and they just knock the whole, they act like it's all religion and this and that. And I, and I see that there are, you know, religious folks that can, like you said in the beginning, like I'm very approachable. Right. People that are overly religious, maybe or they think they're better than other people or something like that. They, they have a problem. Uh, relating. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. don't know, but I feel like, you know, it all when when you, when you can see how it all ties together and how it all makes sense and you put this thing to work it really does god can do anything with anybody i mean dude i, I if god can do that with me i mean and i'm telling you i was broke <laughs> be more than broke and i'm anyway i'm excited <laughs> yeah yeah man and I, I i think ultimately a lot of times you know hearing hearing your story i want to point out two things one, one thing that you said that i thought was really cool but then um two i i think that sometimes when people become christians and they don't come from a a broken past and they just you know maybe for me for example i was brought up 
um, in, a, in a Christian home. I, I had great Christian parents. They brought me up really well. I really, looking back, you know, besides being a troublemaker when I was a teenager, really n- nothing to complain about. And I think sometimes it's harder for people who have the circumstances of life that I have to truly see the goodness of God, ultimately. Because when, when, you, when you kind of have everything and then you become a Christian, to a certain extent, sometimes it's hard to perceive a real change. Or I think part of why I think your story is so powerful is that there are so many people out there that are currently in the circumstances of life that you were in prior to becoming a Christian, that are going through that, that are addicted to drugs, that are alcoholics, that are broken, and just feeling hopeless, you know? And a lot of times in those situations, they're running away from God, not towards him you know, and, and it's unfortunate. And I think what you've shown really, really well is that it was not, it ultimately wasn't until you recognized God and there was that revelation that, oh my goodness, God is real and he can be seen. He can be, he can be understood that your life, you, like you say, you're the happiest you've ever been, you know, and that's not because you're some great guy, even though I think you are, it's because there's a great God that brought you out of those circumstances through his provision, which is wonderful. And I just, okay. I just go ahead. No, I was going to say, don't get me wrong. Like, Oh, your, your video I, just went out. Oh, shoot. Just, oh, shoot. There we go. Trying to turn that off. Okay. Um, uh, don't get me wrong, dude. Like I live a crazy life. Yeah. I have family issues. It's my house is nuts. I'm, I'm lucky I'm down here in my garage for an hour. <laughs> Like, it's crazy. You can't always judge your life by your circumstances. Amen. I, I, I really feel like your mental health is really important, but your mental health and your spiritual health have to be in good standing or the rest of your life is not like, and your physical health matters too. Right. But I'm just like, you know, you can't judge your situation by what you have. Right. Like I, Sometimes I tell my story and I get excited about saying, I got a house now, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? I just live yeah. with my friend, dude, you know, I got a house now. Like they yeah. don't understand. Like, it's not about the house. It's just that God is saying, like, I care about you and you're, you're important too. Like here. Right. And, and, right. And, so, and so, you know, I, there's a lot of people out there too, that like, I feel like, um, we don't give enough. Like I, I, as, as Christians in America, I feel like we don't give enough. We give, but how generous is it, you know? Right. And I feel like um, when you grow up as a poor person, you're more um, inclined to give because it doesn't really matter. Like money's great. It's, you need to pay your bills. Great. But when it comes to like stuff, 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 more stuff, it's, you know, it's time to give. You know what I mean? It's time to take care of some other people because everybody needs a hand up every once in a while. And in my life, people have helped me out tremendously when I was a teenager, let me stay at their house, uh, taking care of me and stuff like that. But, you know, um, getting a little off there. But the thing is, dude, like, I feel like... Again, I just just want to pause you there and just keep reiterating that, like that generosity, for example, like these are all attributes of God. (laughs) that you're you're displaying in your life so i I just i just think that's so cool that you can see tangibly god legitimately working through you in those ways you know so i'll tell you some of my favorite scriptures you probably already know um put them on all my tiktoks (laughs) um number one my favorite scripture in the bible is the lord is a warrior Hmm. and i think people get that backwards like you see all these like guys come out And they're like warrior for Christ. And they have like some like crazy looking angel ninja or something. (laughs) Like, I don't know, like maybe in heaven it is like that. I don't really know, (laughs) but that'd be cool. (laughs) But I feel like Jesus was an amazing like person. Cause like if you think about his mentality and how he's soft enough to give, soft enough to rub his or i mean to wash his disciples feet yet powerful enough to stand up to the the big dogs that's 
that's pretty awesome to wrap your mind around. Right. And you know, that him coming to earth and doing what he did when it says he's a warrior, I, from thinking on that and praying on that, you know, it's like he, uh, he probably battled with himself a lot, you know? Mm. And I think when we are exploring our Christian faith or we want to go out and do stuff, I think it's super important that we look at ourselves and what we do. How can we get better? Like, don't look at other people and be like, they're dumb. They're doing it wrong. They're doing it wrong. Like look in the mirror because the only person you can truly change is yourself. A uh, God can change you, but I mean, you got to want it. You know what I mean? All right. So, but yeah, the Lord is a warrior is a really deep scripture, I think. And like, that's one of my favorites. And another one uh, that is really great is Philippians four, eight, where it says um, to keep your mind on the good things, the holy things. Uh, I think that's super important. Yeah. Too many, too many people now are wound up in like politics all the time. Right. And like all, now all this like end time stuff you know what I'm yep. saying no offense yep. Jonah <laughs> you don't have <laughs> yep I hear you loud and clear no I'm, I'm just saying the uh like I told you a little bit like about people they're watching like conspiracy theory videos yeah and getting like all crazy about worrying about like the end of time they're worried about like this you know flute or the uh covid shot that they're going to come out with they're worried about like the next crazy thing and i feel like you know for me i went through that phase i feel like probably about like six years ago and my pastor took me off to the side and he's like bro shows me this scripture he's like you need to you need to get your head out of that and and focus on god and what he's doing in your life what he's doing in your family and and just ignore all that because it's not going to do anything for you and that's right. probably the most valuable advice you know that i've ever gotten right yeah i th i think that that's that's key and almost tying those those two kind of things together you see you see christ that whole idea of like the warrior right you see him say you know i did not come to earth to to bring peace but to bring a sword you know, that, that, that's what he said. But then you also hear him say, I, I did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that through me, the world might be saved. So we say, okay, how are those two things? How can they both coexist? Well, because in the process of saving the world, it's unpleasant for people because <laughs> people yeah. don't want to be saved, you know? And so it's, it's the idea that he's, he's in the world, saving the world, but there's a war going on because people don't want to be saved, Right. And so, and so we see that picture and then we think, okay, well, how is this war being won? Well, it's not being won by meditating on conspiracies and predicting the end of the world. Yeah. It's, it's on meditating on things that are holy, on things that are righteous, on things that are praiseworthy and ultimately living out the gospel because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Christ dwells within us. You know, are we living that with that reality and that mindset and then living in accordance yeah. with that, you know? Amen, dude. And you know, like with all the work you do, by the way, dude, like <laughs> I feel really blessed to be on here because you're like one of the first TikTok people that I was like, this guy's awesome. I'm showing all my <laughs> wife, show my son. Yeah. I'm, like, I'm showing people to, uh, like, you know, that like when Jesus said that, th that he came to bring a sword, like Satan pretty much run the world at that point. Right. Now, you know, it's time to do battle. But right. thing is, is God's a lot smarter than the human race. <laughs> and, um, yep. It's going down. Like, like I love the way you look at that stuff. Like, I, I'm pretty, uh, pretty impressed. And also, I, I just want to say, you know, you know, I love your channel. But no. man, you, anybody watching this, if you haven't watched Jonah's videos on eschatology and stuff, they're really cool. Appreciate um, that, bro. I have learned so much from you, dude. I got to tell you, like, um, probably like back in March. I saw like a couple of videos of yours and I went to your channel. I followed your page and I just went through all these videos yeah. and I'm like, this is crazy. And like, I, it really got me juiced to read my Bible more. Mm. And I was like, Great thank job. you, dude. Yeah. Yeah. But, I um, love, I love what uh, Doug Wilson says when it comes to 
looking at the depraved world around us, he said that we should have a high view of depravity because mankind is very depraved, but we should never have such a high view of depravity that it overrides our view of God's grace. <laughs> Amen. I just love that picture because we can look and we can see a world that is hostile to God, but if we have the right picture of the grace of God, we, we should have the attitude of you guys are no match. <laughs> You're no match for the grace of God. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I feel like um, I'm seeing a lot of Christians worry too much. Yeah. You know, and like they kind of, they're like, oh, no, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. And they're worried about like current event stuff too much. Right. And I, well, I mean, like, can't you be ignorant like me? Like, <laughs> like <laughs> News. I get you don't even have to watch the news anymore, like or YouTube, because everybody on the street talks about everything. Right, right. So I, I get updated. I come home. My buddy tells me something. I'm like, oh yeah, I always know what I'm talking about. And I don't right. watch anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, walking, talking news stations at every street corner. <laughs> yeah, like we go to work and some the customer or somebody they'll just start shh, going crazy about, dude, all, all that stuff back. Boy, man, like probably like 2015 all the illuminati type stuff started coming up on the mm -hmm. internet yep everybody was watching that stuff and now everybody knows about it you can ask some old lady that's like <laughs> eight years old and she heard of it you know what i mean <laughs> that's true yeah anyway uh, but uh, again. well i don't want to i want i don't want to keep this going too too long i want to make sure that i'm respecting my listeners uh time constraints that they oh, have but but i, I want to i want to let you say whatever else you're going to say and then if we could start thinking of like application points because i i think that a lot of people watching this they might be christians but some some of the people on my channel they're newer they're newer to christianity they're just getting started with this whole thing and so i think that your story here and where you came from where you are now is really important so i really before we even get to the application ultimately i want i want you to just kind of describe life now and what what's changed since becoming a christian what's the fruit of that um okay. and go into that a little bit yeah so um from the time i became a christian till now i went through probably five or six years of i was still struggling with mental illness i believed and knew that jesus was king but I also was still battling with this. Um, I used to be a Thelemite. It was a uh, do what thou wilt. I was still mm. battling with that. Now trying to mix that with Christianity, that constant thinking, I don't yeah. it's hard to explain, but anyway, uh, it, it took years to get away from that. It took years to get away from all the quote unquote, like paranormal supposed activity going on. Yeah. Uh, me and my wife, when we first started attending church, um, we, we thought there was something going on in our house mm -hmm. and we didn't know what was going on. And we had the pastor come and he comes down. I remember he was in my basement and I'm like, I said, Hey man, are like demons and angels real? And he's like, yeah. And I'm just like, Oh crap. My hair stood up on end. And I was like, okay. So that being said, um, every time I would have anxiety or start to have like a mental like stress where I'm getting kind of like manic or whatever, I would be all thinking about that stuff, like yeah. all this demonic stuff. And I'm not saying it's not there, but God has taught me to ignore that stuff because I don't know exactly what's going on and I'm just going to drive myself nuts, uh, trying to figure it out. And so I don't, I don't dabble in any occult. I don't dabble in angel talk, devil talk, demons, de demonology, any of that stuff. And if people are called to do that, I have nothing against them. But for me personally, I just don't even go there. I ain't afraid of no ghosts, uh, but <laughs> I'm not, yeah. I'm not playing with that uh, because of my past. Um, I've literally feel like I've seen sort of Satan's work. Uh, sure kind of manifest in my life like uh depression oppression and feeling like just a weight on my shoulders all the time and being stressed out and i just i just leave that for the experts <laughs> i sure. just I, 
got to stay away from that stuff. So that there is one huge thing for me, like growing up as a kid, being around my mom, we'd be eating dinner and she'd come in. She'd, my mom's an art. Check this out real quick. My mom is a really good artist. She drew these when I was a kid. Oh, wow. That's my stepdad right there. Looks just Got like it. him. Wow. Anyhow, but my mom cool. used to um, sit down for hours and draw these big elaborate like numerology charts. And mm. she would be telling us our horoscope and numerology stuff all the time. To me, it's like white noise. I used to hate it as a kid. I hate it now when people are talking about astrology. I know probably more about astrology than a lot of people, but I don't even, I don't play with any of that kind of stuff. Right. Uh, but the thing is, you know, that part of having mental health, ignoring all that crap is a huge, huge thing, huge obstacle for me. Right. Another obstacle is it took me, um, I'd say about six or seven years to get on the proper medication. Like mm. I'd struggled with, I'm not going to take it. I'll try to take it. And to be honest with you, the medicine I'm on now, I'm not on a very high dose at all. It's very, I'm barely in the therapeutic range, like, or whatever. But the thing is, is I take my medicine and my wife is like riding me all the time if I miss it or something like that. Sure. So, I'm uh, but the thing is, um, my mental health, uh, it took a long time for me to ignore all the spiritual stuff, right. ignore like aliens and right. evolution and driving myself nuts about all that kind of stuff. Right. Uh, speaking of which, you know, I'm, I don't, I don't like to talk about that stuff, even like evolution, like I, you get in arguments with atheists about evolution, whatever. Yeah. Um, my younger brother is actually a um, genius. Uh, but he went to school for biochemistry mm. on an academic scholarship. He's like super smart. And me and him wow. sit down, we'll talk about biology, you know, evolution with him. That's not a big deal. But when it comes to like other people and arguing, I don't do that. I try to avoid arguments, avoid yeah. any kind of negative. Like I'm sort of a hippie, I guess. I just kind of <laughs> just keep me happy. Keep that yeah. crap. I'll stay. But uh, yeah, I, you know, that's, a huge thing. Um, another big part of my life is uh, I have a really good friend who used to be a uh, Mennonite. I don't know if you know what that is. Is that it's like a, uh, the whole? Is that go? You tell me. I, I might not. It, well, yeah, it's like one step back from being Amish, pretty much. Okay. And so he grew up with the Bible. Um, grew up around you know, good family all that stuff. He left the Mennonite church when he was like 20 or something like that. But he was like the first friend. I was a Christian for probably like three years without any Christian friends, no friends from church. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody ever from the church said, Hey, you know, you're, you're welcome here or anything. We just went there, talked to the pastor a little bit left. We didn't make friends with anybody. And my friend, his name's Bob. Uh, we're really good friends now. Like we've been running. I like the long distance run. Yeah. Keeps me in shape. So we do a little trail running. Did some cool. of this. But uh, exercise for me is huge. And I feel like, you know, all of these little things came because I started to obey what God's commands are, what God wants me to do. Like, you know, when you're doing something wrong. And I still ain't got it perfect, but I'm getting close. <laughs> yeah. Thing is, you you know when you're doing something wrong and when right. God's like that. So I'm still, I'm still with that's that. That's amazing, man, because you see that that's, that's the work of the spirit ultimately, right? The spirit yeah. comes in, regenerates you, gives you that new heart. And then you, you naturally start having new desires, new, new, new tastes, new loves, new everything. And so the whole idea of, I don't want to talk about that stuff anymore, you know? Well, why don't you want to talk about it? Well, because the spirit's given you a new heart. That's, that's, that's repulsed by stuff like that. You know, it's, yeah. it's beautiful to see that because, you know, I think a lot of people forget that when you become a Christian, it's a resurrection that takes place. You know, it's not just, I have this ticket and now I'm good. No, you're, you're resurrected. It says that we were dead in sin 
children of wrath, and then God made us alive together with Christ. So what we see there is there is literally a resurrection. We share in Christ's death. We share in his burial. We share in his resurrection. And so it's through that newness of life that we have the new desires that we do. And yeah. I just, I find that so beautiful whenever I talk to somebody and they give their story to, to tangibly be able to see that newness of life being displayed. Um, and the fact that it's kind of like, yeah, this happened. I don't know how to fully explain why or how it just happened. And it's just like, that's the spirit. You know, I get so pumped up, man. It's awesome. That's cool, bro. Yeah, man. I mean, I, I'm like I said, I wake up every day. I'm like, thank you, God, for another chance. And yeah. I'm, I'm happy. I mean, big martial arts is a huge part of my life. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, um, I love boxing. I love kickboxing. I, I train more now than I train myself. I'm training my friend's wife right now for a Muay Thai tournament. Nice. And it's, it's really exciting. And, uh, I don't know. The martial arts are a really, really good thing for someone that has been through the type of stuff I have Definitely. because like the way it kind of works is, is like, this is how God laid that out. I feel like you start to exercise and you're getting that. That's a huge thing. Get your blood pump and get all that crap out of you. Right. You know, do it. but with the martial arts, if you're training for a fight, your training is super important. Your self-discipline is super important. And at first you don't really get what you're doing. You're just going through the motions and it's like, uh-oh, I got to eat better. And then after a while, it's like, uh-oh, I better stop hanging out with those people because they're always like drinking booze and stuff and I got to get away from that. And then it's for me, that's how it, it kind of went down. And it's like, I slowly started getting a little more discipline, a little more discipline. And then it's like, when that, when you do fights or tournaments or whatever, yeah. like you ever done any jujitsu tournaments? Yeah, I have. But you know, the seriousness that you have to get, like you, everything you eat, drink, sleep is your training. Right. And that's the type of environment that someone needs to be in. I think if they yeah. want to really get away from drugs and stuff, like you can go to rehab, you can go to AA, that stuff's great. It really works for some people, but for other people, like, they go there and they have to go there for the rest of their life. Right. Like they're ever going to be done with it. You know what there, I mean? There's something about martial arts and me coming from a, a martial arts background as well. And more specifically strength and conditioning. There's something about that discipline that it builds that I think is very helpful for people that are stuck with addictions because addiction ultimately comes and flows out of most, most times a broken past, but ultimately a lack of discipline in life, you know, a kind of floundering, looking for something. And so when you put somebody into a structured thing, and basically, you say, hey, if you want to succeed at this, you've got to eat, sleep and breathe it, you know, that yeah. that does something to the mindset that somebody has. And I've watched people that I've that I've trained in the past that have come to me, and they've been depressed, or they've been struggling with, with different things. The moment that that switch happens in their mind you see it you can see it and it's it's really cool to to see people lock into that mindset and and really improve themselves through these these awesome arts hey man yeah dude yeah plus you know when it comes to addiction if you're talking about someone that has an addiction for me i felt like my I, dude i was i almost killed myself with cocaine bro <laughs> like yeah, i mean i was addicted bad uh, and like I couldn't stop and the thing is when you take someone that has to constantly have something yeah and put them first of all they're getting the exercise they're getting rid of all that crap and they can put that addicting thing into their training and be one of the best people in there uh, right. I've seen it many times right so, yeah anyway yeah dude that's <laughs> awesome man yeah and I, I think it's cool to watch how God works and places us in specific things because like you said you know some people they need something like aa you know or rehab to to recover but then there's other people that that kind of thing is not going to work they're just going to be stuck there the rest of their lives feeling miserable wanting this substance but not not being able to get to it you know and then there's other people they start up a martial art and boom you know and i i've seen so many crazy stories of so many different people that have have joined either either martial arts or they've started lifting and it's through exercise and through that that physicality that they've been able to channel that addictive straight in and become addicted to something that is that is positive you know and, and awesome so 
Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I worked, like I told you before, I, I worked at a martial arts ministry for five years. Yeah. Uh, the ministries at a place where they're fixing up a building, they're not going to be open for a while. The COVID thing's got everything all screwed up. Right. I'd like to go back to that. You know what I mean? There's, there's been some stuff, but thing is, um, tying sports or martial arts or anything like that in the ministry is a really, really good way to get to people. Yes. The problem that we always have is we get so busy. We need a disciple program Yeah. for people. You know what I mean? Because right we'll baptize people and get them they're in it to win it but then they they lose traction because their former life you know how that is it tries to just take over again and right. it, it's tough but um i don't know i feel like god's gonna help us figure that out i feel like god's gonna fix uh things and get things back as soon as we get over this covid stuff so yeah I'm pretty definitely oh that's <laughs> huge though that you just touched on discipleship you know i think that oftentimes and i think that this has a broad application and context but i think too often people are so almost in this idea of preaching the gospel with almost numbers in mind the more people we get the better this is awesome and they get yeah. obsessed with that bringing people in numbers oriented that we forget that just because somebody says yeah this sounds great i believe that that doesn't mean we stop there you know the command from christ was was to go and disciple the nations not go preach the gospel and then you know run off and find another person disciple right there's an active there's a relationship there there's a there's a establishment of i'm going to be beside you i'm going to be teaching you i'm going to be training you and we see this in scripture you see all these churches that are messed up like the church in corinth right they're, they're sleeping around and having orgies and all sorts of stuff. And Paul's coming in and going, guys, this is not the way you're supposed to be. And he's, he's explaining them. He's teaching them. He's discipling them. And so I think that one of the things we're missing in the church today is we've turned the church into a place where we bring the lost. Mm -hmm. But the church is a place where we disciple. And then through that discipleship, we go out and we reach the lost. And then we bring those new disciples in to further disciple so they can go out and reach the lost, you know? And so that's ultimately the purpose of, of the church. That's the purpose, I think, of every ministry. I think if we keep that in mind, man, the difference we can make would be exponential. If we could cut out all the crap, <laughs> yeah. like there's so much, like I know people that won't go to church because when they do go to church, it's all about like the fancy dress or the car or whatever. Yeah. And, and people get too caught up in that. Like it's high school again or something instead yeah. of like, I'm here to learn how to save people's souls or to help save people's souls and talk to people about Christ, whatever it is. Right. And I feel like, you know, I've seen, and I've been where you just said, where let's just get them in as many as possible. So real quick thing. We baptized 14 people last year at our ministry. Problem is we got them all in there. I'm only one guy. <laughs> I'm doing all this stuff. And yeah. a lot of people went back to their old lives and maybe they're saved. I, I, I don't know. Some of the people kind of like dropped the whole Christian thing. And I feel like it was like what you said earlier, like I felt like they came in, I got the Christian card now right. and then they're like, I'm good and just do whatever they want. And it's right. like, you know, I feel like I do whatever I want now, but my wants are a little bit different than they right. were 20 years ago. <laughs> and I, and so, I think some of that comes from our culture's lack of knowing how to properly explain the, the gospel i think that we've kind of we've lost sight of how the gospel is to be presented and we've presented it in such a way where we're going to people basically saying hey ask jesus into your heart and and you're good to go and so people have this notion you know that we're, we're asking jesus into our heart we get the ticket of salvation we walk around with that now what happens when life starts getting hard and all these things start happening well you, you kind of drop that maybe, or you, you feel almost that's the, that's the mentality I think a lot of people have, where what we need to recognize is the posture is not that we are, we're holding something that tells us we're saved. The posture is we're being held by Christ. And it's not looking back on a baptism we got 
10, 15 years ago to, to say, yeah, I'm saved because I got baptized 15 years ago. No, all you should do is look at your current posture. Where are you currently? What's your current posture? And that, that shows you whether or not that was real 15 years ago. You know, and I think too many people, they, they, they think of it as, you know, I walked the aisle, I said the prayer, I'm saved. And they look to that as their verification rather than looking to their present posture towards Christ, towards God. And I, yeah. that, that's, that's how we need to explain the gospel. So, so I got a question for you. Um, yeah, just real quick. Uh, you know, the scripture that says fear, um, is the beginning of knowledge. Yes. F the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom or yeah. About this to a couple of people recently. I would love to hear this real quick. <laughs> yeah. Can you repeat the question? You cut out there for just a second. Oh, I said, uh, how would you explain to someone that is not a Christian that fear is the beginning of knowledge? Yeah. I mean, I think the best way that we can approach this is, tr is first defining what does fear mean? Because we as Western thinkers, when we think of fear, that means to be terrified of, right? Oh, I'm scared. I don't want to be anywhere near that. that that's, uh, that's typically the association. And so when you're talking to a non-believer, the fear of the Lord, really what that word is meaning is it's the reverence, the, the acknowledgement of the sovereignty of who God is, the weightiness of who he is. And when, when we recognize that, that fills us up with a healthy fear of the Lord. Um, yeah. And I, I think, uh, what, what is it? Uh, in Narnia, right? You yeah. have Aslan. And in, in, in that in that episode, uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, right? The very end, Mr. Tumnus is talking to Lucy, and she says, is, is, he, is he safe? And he goes, no, of course he's not safe, but he's good, right? And I think that picture that C.S. Lewis gave is, is so poignant because that, that, that is who God is. We should yeah. have that understanding that, no, he's not safe. He's the God of the universe. He could snap his fingers and smite us if he yeah. wanted to but he's good and he loves us. And so the yeah. fear of the Lord is re once you recognize the sovereignty of God, the bigness of God, who God is, and that weightiness affects you, that's the beginning of knowing something. <laughs> you're, you're right on, man. That's awesome. I was going to say, like, thinking back to when I first became a Christian or started thinking about God, I, like I saw that scripture. Yeah. And to be honest with you, I was like terrified of God at first. I was scared. I didn't know what I was doing. I thought I got to do everything perfectly. I went through the years of like me trying to like do everything perfect and be all scared all the time. Right. But I feel like that was the beginning. Now I know Jesus. Yes. I know his spirit. I know what he's about. I know the fruits of the spirit. I know what God's doing in my life. And so now I still have respect for, like you said, what God, who God is and how powerful God is. Right. Now I like perfect love drives out fear. Right. So right. that I understand his perfect love. It's, it's not so much fear. It's more right. of just like, and that's the thing as, as a Christian, <laughs> there is no fear because we're in Christ Jesus. If we're in Christ Jesus, there's therefore no condemnation. But if you're not in Christ Jesus, you should be terrified because you're under the righteous wrath of an eternal God. That should scare you, you know? And so for us Christians, praise the Lord that my imperfect sinful self has been completely washed clean in the blood of Christ. But if I'm outside of Christ, man, you, there's every reason in the world to fear. So to, to wrap this up, brother, what, what's your application points? Uh, Cause I think there's a lot of people that could really, that are maybe watching this going, man, that's my story. That's where I'm at. Or, or relating to something you said, what, what's your encouragement you give to people listening? Yeah. Amen. Well, you know, do yourself a favor. Don't be shy. Um, part of my thing was I was shy to talk to people at church. I didn't fit in and I'm like, I don't belong here. And, you know, I had a hard time just attending church, you know? Yeah. Uh, but when I met my friend, Bob, uh, I met another kid named Michael, who was a student of mine, who's really, really cool. Um, but you got to you gotta surround yourself with people that can have, I remember the first time me and him had a conversation about the Bible. Mm. And I was just blown away, like, wow, somebody actually thinks like me? Like, what the heck? <laughs> like, yeah. this is like three years later after starting going to church, 
that I had a Christian friend to talk spiritual talk with, you know? Right. right. So I, that is huge. Community. And so now um, I feel like if you have a Christian friend uh, and you have the ability to be accepted at your church, get involved, learn, try to learn. You know what I mean? Like the Bible's hard. And to be honest with you, I don't know the whole Bible yet. But the thing is, it, this is a con. Well, I, it drives me nuts when somebody's like, "Yeah, I read it like five times." I'm like, "Yeah." <laughs> anyway, so the thing is, is I, I'm the kind of person that I I take a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. I can't sit down and just it, it runs together for me. But the point of it is, is you know, you got to get um, someone that can support you, and oh. you got to get in that Bible, and you need to find a church that you trust the people. Amen. And I didn't, I'm at a different church now than I started going to. I love my church. I love my pastor. I love all the people at my church. I have learned so much from going to um, adult discussion classes yeah. and just, um, I'm not religious about it. Like I, I try to go every week, but sometimes, right. you know, we, you know, it gets crazy, but we, we try to be attentive. I, I love the discussion class. I ended up becoming a teacher at my church. I, they ended up inviting me to be on a couple of like committees and stuff. So yeah. I helped out a little bit. Helping out and being on committees is cool because it's like, okay, um, it's good for me because I want to learn. I, I always want to know like how, how, how is a church set up? Is it all, you know, the pastor lying in his pockets of money or what? Yeah. So I got a little bit involved and learned a thing or two about how churches operate. Yeah. And I think, great and like i trust that where my money is going uh you actually if you go to church they're supposed to if you ask uh where all the money goes they're supposed to show you all the ministries they donate to and what they do so it's there's there's a lot of rumors out there about churches and so you have all these people that sit at home they try to read the bible i don't know they're on tiktok they don't have a church and they right. think they know scriptures i've been there but right. the thing is is you got to get into a church that you trust so. Amen. Yeah, I would say that's, that is vital. So, well, brother, I'm going to close us in prayer. I thank you so much for being on today. I, I, I pray people are encouraged by this. I was encouraged by it. That was a powerful story. And um, I'm grateful for your friendship and your support of my ministry and your love for the Lord, man. I, I really appreciate you. So let me close us in prayer and then we'll, we'll wrap this up. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to come before you, and I want, to, I want to thank you for my brother, Sean. I thank you for his willingness to come on this show, Lord. Um, and I pray that the people listening right now, Lord, they're encouraged. Um, Sean's different than a lot of the other guests that I've had on. Uh, he has a very unique story um, from a, a very uh, difficult past, Lord. And I just pray that people are encouraged to see your sovereignty and your work in him as you brought a broken person just like all of us and made us new made sean new made me new lord and we we worship you and we we revel in the marvelous mystery of salvation lord that a broken man can become a god-fearing god-loving man uh we we just are amazed at that and we recognize it's only by the grace of god through faith that we can even stand in the position we are today um, in right relationship with you, reconciled to you through the cross of Christ, Lord. And so I, I lift Sean up to you. I, I lift up his continued ministry. Um, I know that he has um, a unique ministry as I think that he's able to, to talk to people like atheists and, and others who may not be as receptive to other Christians, Lord. And so I pray you would just use him mightily, help him to speak your truth to them, um, help him to love them. Um, and ultimately, I pray that you would receive all the glory, honor, and praise from both our ministries and from this podcast when, those, when people listen to it, Lord. We love you, and it's in your precious name, Jesus, we ask all these things. Amen. Amen.